Welcome to the 18th Massachusetts Review Anne Halley Prize reading for our 2021 winner, Robert Whitehead. I'm Ellen Dory Watson. Pre-pandemic, we would be hosted by our good friends at Amherst Books in Amherst, sitting all in the same room, which would be dreamy, sigh, but the advantage of Zoom is that there are folks here who couldn't otherwise be with us and have the chance to hear Robert read. So there's, there's some good things about it too. I wanna let you know that there's a gorgeous broadside that our art person, our director, um, Pamela, God, Pam Glavin, <laughs> losing my head, um, designed its letterpress, it's gorgeous, it's of the winning poem and um, please check in with us and you, you can purchase one. There'll be information in the chat about that. Um, <clears throat> let's see, also this reading is recorded so that if you know someone who wished they were here, please let them know and um, you can find out later afterwards um, a link to see the reading after the fact. Okay. <clears throat> Mass Review's Poetry Prize is named for Anne Halley, poet, teacher, longtime Mass Review poetry editor, whose friends and colleagues at UMass underwrite this annual prize in her memory and honor. This is the first Halley Prize reading without the ebullient presence of Jules Chemetsky, Anne's husband, and not only a founder of the magazine, but its very heart. Jules died this past fall. He is an American literary, was an American literary critic, writer, editor, unionist, his essays in the 60s and 70s on the importance of race, ethnicity, class, and gender to American literary culture, anticipated the later schools of new historicism and cultural studies in American letters, and defined the interest and values of mass review. Our Jules Chemetsky translation prize, which he nigh unto refused to let us name after him, has been around for a decade by now, but doesn't hold annual public readings. And so we're so unused to not having Jules around, wise counselor and truly beloved friend, that I thought this year, instead of reading a poem of Anne's, though he would no doubt disapprove, I would dedicate this opening moment to him. His presence is surely with us, but I think it's fair to say that everyone who knew him well deeply misses his intellectual brilliance, his just and generous advice and his ready laugh. And now on toward the poetry. <clears throat> the annual Anne Halley Prize celebrates one poem from the past year's four issues. And this year was judged by the former poetry editors, myself and Deborah Gorlin. After many decades, as many of you know, Deb and I stepped down last summer after completing a celebratory first all poetry issue of MR. Check it out, copies are still available. We're really proud of it. Mass Review's poetry department is now in the hands of the fabulous duo of Nathan McLean and Franny Choi, who have done a stellar job taking up the baton and running with it. And now finally to the poetry and our 2022 Halley winner. Robert M. Whitehead is an extraordinary poet. He lives in Philadelphia where he works as a writer and designer for a university hospital. He received his MFA from Washington University in St. Louis and has been a fellow at the Bucknell Seminar for Younger Poets, Ashbury Home School and Vermont Studio Center. In addition to the five poems in Mass Review, Robert's work has appeared or is forthcoming from Gulf Coast, Verse Daily, Jerry, Denver Quarterly, The Collagist and elsewhere. I was also super interested to learn of his project to create poems that rewrite the Bible substituting homophobic language with language that is inclusive, celebratory, and personal." Unquote. In addition, Robert teaches online classes, a couple of them called Poetry and Translation, The Poet's Journal, The Poetics of Grief. And I was impressed by a quote on his website about this. I teach the poetry courses that I want to take, he writes, working alongside my students to expand our sense of what poetry can accomplish. When Deb and I came upon Robert's poems in the 
submission manager at, UMA, at, at Master Review, we felt as though we've been given a lesson in what poetry can accomplish, in the many things that poetry can accomplish. We generally accepted single poems and occasionally pairs, and very occasionally when we couldn't resist, we'd do a little section of five or so, which we immediately knew we would have to do in this case when we encountered his poems. We'd never be able to choose just one or two. Hungry for more, we asked for more, and finally with much difficulty settled on the five poems that showcase the amazing depth and breadth of his work. I'm sure I'm gonna say this wrong, but Borum traces, these are the five poems, the marks and pox, quote unquote, of an Irish landscape, quote, the original ache under which the glacial soiled soil writhed, and turns out to be about love and sacredness and quote, our own methods for flowering. Lilith carries both hard advice and hope to endure the moments, quote, when we are halved by a hateful world, unquote. The principle of eternal return says, to stay sane, find ways to talk about your body like it is a setting you have stumbled into and do not yet understand. Oh, these insights, these formulations. Then there's the pyramid poem high. Robert has a number of these all caps pyramid shaped poems. HI is the, is the parenthetical title of this one. The word at the pinnacle of it is high. This poem blew us away, chiseled and formally bold and precise as it is, but voiced with breathtaking openness and intimacy. We might have been hard pressed to make a final decision on the prize poem, but for the fact that High was soon chosen to appear in Best American Poetry 2022. So why not shine the light on another wonderful poem in the batch? David was our clear choice. By retelling the story of the fabled hero, the breathless narrator of Robert Whitehead's inspirational of the moment poem exhorts us to be like David to marshal our own naked energies and hard won hopes, our own all he had to fight, quote unquote, to win an improbable victory over the Goliath-like perils in our midst. Whitehead insistently but tenderly leads us to a new understanding of heroism, one that is not a monolithic state of steady bravery. His canny use of hyphens and dashes reveals that courage is instead a mix of muster and mastery, of struggle and success, of fear and fearlessness. This is the state of mind we must develop to be ready to hurl the rock. By the poem's end, the poet has thoroughly convinced us to heed his thrilling imperative, quote, not to run from it. This last bit was our judge's statement written um, together, uh, Deb and I. In choosing our Halley winners, we have traditionally excluded work by poets who are already well-established with many books and prizes, preferring instead to spotlight an ir irresistible poem by someone with at least one book whose career would get a good boost from such a prize. With the one exception of Ross Gay, whose work gave us no choice. He's Ross Gay. It's good to have rules that make sense, and also to have the sense sometimes to break them. The other loose guideline we went by was to award the prize to someone with at least one published book. So the award could boost it and our usual host Amherst Books could sell it. And only once over these 18 years did we break that precedent. In 2011, we chose Joanne Dominique Dwyer's poem, Bullseye. Dwyer went on to have a poem chosen for the annual volume of the Best American Poetry too. And in the 11 years since the, Haley, since the Haley win, she has published two astonishing books of poetry. We expect no less from this year's equally exceptional winner. And we're truly delighted finally to hear the poems in his voice. A big armed welcome from all of us at MR and all, everyone here to you, Robert Whitehead. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um... That was a very beautiful introduction. I hope at some point um, fate will allow me to return the favor and embarrass you in public with some beautiful <laughs> things about your poems. Um, Ellen is a fantastic poet. I'm so honored that she and Deb chose my work uh, for this prize. So honored to have appeared in this magazine. 
um, that they so fastidiously shepherded and championed for, you know, the last couple years. Um, I remember, I mean, I've been a fan of poetry. I've been a writer of poetry um, my whole life. It's kind of how I escaped, how I escaped to understand the world. And if I look, um, if I look through my memory to the child, Robert, um, and imagine what he would feel uh, seeing me stand here, um, it's immense pride. And so I thank you for allowing me to stand here with you all. Um, poetry readings are like sex in that it's better if other people are in the room, um, but we're gonna do our best uh, with um, my blank screen in front of me um, to create some sort of feeling. And I'm gonna start uh, by reading the, um, the, uh, the award-winning poem, uh, the Anne Haley poem, David. This um, poem is, as they mentioned, uh, available to purchase. Um, so this is the broadside, uh, which I am Vanna Whiting for you here. Uh, it's really gorgeous. It's letter pressed. It's signed, some of them, um, by my own hand. Um, so if you want one, please go to the link. They're gorgeous. Um, if you know me, I'll give you one. So just send me a text. David. The so handsome marble form of a boy, a fool, showing up unguarded for the fight, appearing naked in front of what is giant and terrifying. Did you hear me? He, the hero who is the fool transformed, which is his form, the idea of being renewed a bestowal, how Messiah he stands. I said bestowal, a myth, which then meets the craft of his mantle, his knuckle, the tight punctuation of his neck, his nipple, the carriage of his hip holds us. We have been sharing this psychology, quiet, how still and quiet, Standing alone we are. The peril wears its massive outfit, aiming at us. And David, with his sheepskin slingshot, with his all he had to fight Goliath, it was so small in its human way, almost a worthless tool, he wins with it. Did you hear me? He won. He had it, the everything of the self, the I, the call, a fearlessness within fear, a living with it, subverting it, placing a rock in a cloth and releasing. The mammoth troop of his anger was a foe falling down, a rock lodged in its forehead. Do not run from this feeling. Um, I should note that um, that poem was written um, at, a, at a residency, I will not name, <laughs> um, after I had learned that one of the residents um, who had a, appeared at that residency a number of times um, was a serial abuser. He was using his art as a way to get women naked and in his studio. Um, and it filled me with rage. Um, and so when I say do not run from this feeling, the feeling is rage. Um, what rage can accomplish? Uh, it, it's very powerful and I think um, when channeled um, in a constructive way uh, can, can get a lot done. Uh, this is a poem uh, also written at that residency. Um, I was attacked by flies in the desert. How I knew. 
When the blue mountain arched her back, when the dry riverbank suddenly began to weep, when the grasses all in sway turned suddenly to stop and stare straight up, then a cloud of flies like the wind speaking approached from a midday distance, a mass of them giant as the swarm that rose from behind the leper, rising from his apparent death, humming, walking out, shrugging off the shroud. As they passed the lit shrub uh, under no discernible fire, withered to a dry speck, the tungsten glowed in the mines underneath. I watched the flies decide all at once to break their long engagement with flight and supper on the cup above my collarbone, the spoon of my upper lip. No matter which way I was shaken, they shook with me. A cage so alike my own skin, it stung at every corner. How I knew is I remembered the flies in every version of hell profit off panic. And that inside that panic, at the very center of the wheel, there is a point that never spins, despite everything around it spinning. Um, I, uh, the next poem, um, is uh, Elegy. I, I um, teach, as um, Ellen mentioned in the introduction, I teach online poetry courses uh, here and there. And some of my beautiful students, I see their names in the attendees. So what's up, Writers Rock? Um, the last class I just taught was uh, the Poetics of Grief. And um, grief is everywhere and um, incessant and unstoppable um, these days, um, both personally and culturally. Uh, I, I just saw this uh, friend of mine um, put this great message on uh, Instagram or, or Twitter or one of those saying, uh, the grief is coming so quickly and so frequently that what we're starting to do is to grieve grief we're sort of collapsing onto grief um, with no way to sort of process these horrors that are coming at us from every angle. Um, and being able to teach a class and, and use poetry as a tool to help us understand our grief and um, poetry's long tradition with grief uh, was really instructive and very helpful. This is a poem I wrote after uh, that class. And it is um, in reference to a wonderful poet uh, who passed away uh, very suddenly a few years ago, Marnie Ludwig, um, who I went to grad school with. I had the honor of and privilege of learning with and from. And the title is taken from one of her poems. Listen, I am returning to where you are. I saw another woman with your hairdo today, red as a choke cherry, streaking by to catch the trolley. And last week I saw your face in this bust of a saint, wearing a thin veil of stone, rippling in a stone wind. The season's gulls laughed overhead, and I thought I heard your laugh. Like you, the purple iris woke me at dawn, just calling to say hello. Hello. The last time I saw you in the flesh, you had a rag in hand, sweat damp from work, wiping the bar. Now all I have is this strange glass behind my eye, Marnie. I don't know what else to do but fill it. Fill it up 
and pour it out. Um, this was another poem that Ellen mentioned in the introduction, so I thought I'd give it a read. Uh, it's entitled Lilith. Lilith was the original Eve um, who was cast out of the story um, as well as cast out of paradise and turned into a sort of demon um, that settled next to a sea. Um, and I think she's a really swell gal who doesn't get her fair, fair share. Lilith. All around us, the settings have been configured to signal when the good king is ready to make an executioner of himself. And then the evidence tears out its own feathers while the good king tucks into a roast and burns expensive candles. Do not be concerned with creating yourself in a losing battle. You must now foreign your heart from the shiny fashionables and smirk as the sentinels roll by in their hot tanks. Resilience is a surface. It looks like industry. It gleams and is. Anything could be underneath. As the unit of beauty is most often is estrangement. As the flute hawk isn't a real bird, but can't you imagine its flat predator song in the secret wood? If we've been halved by the hateful world, let us half it again. Bear the submission, half it endlessly until we are an atom. We are a small split thing endlessly splitting, always nearly deleted, but always nearly and never entirely. Um, there um, was another great poet, uh, is another great poet I went to grad school with, um, Ricky Laurentis. Uh, she uh, is a fantastic poet. Their first book, Boy with Thorn. Um, please read if you haven't, it's incredible. Um, when we were getting ready at the end of our um, graduate program to, you know, do the thesis, um, thesis reading, we had both realized that without, um, without talking to each other, we had both written poems about moths that were stuck on the surface of water, which is a very specific um, image. And uh, I don't know, it must have been sort of floating around in the ether, but we both wrote a poem called Moth on Water. So this is for Ricky Laurentis. With my two calm hands on the parish door of the filled bird bath, I attended a stuck moth. A rescue would be out of the question. The wings had been robbed. The body doubled as a billows with all its empty. I stayed close and attentive as the miniature angel unraveled, as she felt as long as she could for a wind. Holding it wouldn't save it. The folding water unfolded and finally went flat. If a million moths were lost each century, this was just another. She dropped her sails to float taking to drowning like a moth flying backwards through sleep. At the bottom, she placed her dust on the anvil dark and waited for a spark.
Um, I don't sleep very well, but I have really good um, eye cream. <laughs> uh, so um, this is a poem called, What is Sleeping? I'd love to know, what is sleeping? My velvet bed eats dust all day and my pillow keeps a single hair for every hour I have not slept. It seems even when I'm in the room and my eyes are closed, my bed is always in a different room making half heard conversation behind a green wall. I used to be someone who could sleep standing up in the middle of a tornado. I told that to a doctor once, which was noted in the chart. Now I turn my key in the door and my bed is drawing two dark circles in every mirror. Now, when the sun comes up, I see my body open the closet, dress for work, then so close to me, whispering in my ear, say, good luck out there. Um, I actually work from home. This is my office as well as my um, poetry reading stage. Um, so my boyfriend leaves the house. He goes to work. He um, drives somewhere and puts on clothes and dresses in the morning. And I always say to him before he leaves, good luck out there. Um, it was a good day. You'll soon find that's an ironic title. It was a good day. The day after the stars blinked off with an inexhaustible steam and the indiscreet angels gathered in fields to saw off their own wings. The day the shoreline split and beveled in the most inconvenient ways, diverting all the buses. The day dogs ran to stumps, looking for new masters. That day weeks ago, while walking to work, I couldn't remember what the zone of orange flags was before it was a zone of orange flags. I just kept walking. The day I stopped walking to work, that time a swarm flew through my house, devouring, and it was a sign of luck because I still had a house. I just kept working. The day lightning struck the ocean and where it struck, the incurable ocean opened an eye of fire, staring down the gods who had not yet departed from the heavens. The day the news was stripped from materials and hauled away in trucks. I kept sabbatical with my weariness in my lap, laughing the laugh of a child who has exhausted weeping. Um, as um, Ellen also mentioned, I have these poems that are pyramids. Um, they're shaped like triangles and they're all caps on the page. Um, I wrote these during a time when I just couldn't get out of bed um, and instead was reading conspiracy theories about what the pyramids are, what they're meant to do, what their function is. Um, and one of the conspiracy theories is that they are these resurrection machines, that they were sort of constructed with the belief that whoever is entombed within can one day um, rise. And so that's the function of the form is, I was hoping to one day rise. And so I wrote these pyramid poems. Hi, how are you doing today? 
And when do you think it will end? Sometimes I am a man, but the trick is to let the feeling pass without it harming you. When I left home today, I left a feeling like, why be alive? I ask the question and commit myself to the answer where I am not eating my own tail. Hi, I still fear I will eat my own tail. At the neurochemical level, euphoria is a language and as such has the potential to become untranslatable. Calendula used to be my mainstay when I needed a yellow shock and so I would turn left at the stoplight down the block and say hi to the calendula, which could mean in Latin, they say, little weather glass or little clock. The trick is to lean into their yellow audience and breathe until one day the flowers all wilt and all you have is how you called to them in the afternoon. Hi, my little calendars. Another day has passed, I imagined would not. This is another pyramid poem um, written a very long time ago. Um, and the saddest part of that is that it could have been written yesterday. Hi, I am creating a record. As once I am back, I will need to know which country I live in. I will need a strickenness to be said here that matches my inability to say just how deep the ocean is or how raptor bird by raptor bird, it all went south. Hi, where are all the oracles with their, their disclosing winds? The schools close to bury their dead. The record will say every day was a slavishness called, okay, hi, I'm doing okay. Like a fine gown on a gray body like a candle burning as I rest my eyes, then eventually fall asleep. Hi, did we linger so long in the fight for our own lives that now we're unsure what we fight to keep? In species stress, the mantis eats its own and is considered a smart investment. Tell me, does the eaten mantis ever realize it was eaten? Um, this is a third and last pyramid poem. Um, I often walk past this beautiful, um, just really lovely restaurant in Philadelphia um, where people sit on the sidewalk and you know, have mimosas and talk with their friends, have a lovely time. And it's right on a park. It's just very, very ritzy and, and lovely. And it, whenever I walk by, the only thing I can think is, man, I wanna like kick these tables <laughs> and I want to see their flatware and plates fall to the ground. Um, I don't do it, but that's the thought every time. Um, Hi, how is it going? The end is at hand, therefore eat a peach when it is ripe and let the pit rot in the yard. Be brave and kick the tables covered in delicate glass flutes at the sidewalk brasserie. We have come to the edge of the age of control. So therefore, Move to that stone ruin at the bottom of the valley and rebuild it in the rain. 
so long you have been holding the math in your head. It is time to lay the numbers in the river for the next civilization to mine. Why give a false answer? It is going well, and like a well is dark and impossible to get out of. When the hunger for more life feels absurd, I think of when the hurricane came and the wild horses of Shackelford Banks in North Carolina found the highest ground, turned their hinds and weathered it. The day the storm broke, the rangers found a new foal among them and took a picture of her gazing back into the eye of the lens. Um, I am translating the Bible. Don't ask me how it's going. <laughs> um, but there, uh, there's some moments that feel fun. And this is one moment from Genesis, um, Genesis chapter three, which is like when Adam and Eve realized that they're naked. Genesis three. And opened were the eyes of both of them. Both of them opened their eyes. And as naked as they knew, as exposed as they were, they sewed together leaves of the fig tree, sutured fig tree leaves together, and made for themselves girdles. To girdle, verb, to cut through the bark all the way around a tree or branch. They cut the fig leaf from the bark and fashioned girdles, sewing all night, eating figs. God said, where are you? To girdle the tree makes the tree more fruitful. And they heard the sound of God walking down in the up garden at the breeze of day. And God called to the fugitives saying to the empty forest, where are you? The tree of which God commanded them not to eat stood eaten. The snake girdled to its bark like the streak of a saw blade. And God said to the snake and the snake heard the voice of God say, cursed, contemptible, the voice said, go on your belly, eat dust. Why did they eat the apple? To feel good if they had the chance. Was it worth it? Whenever we have the chance, we do it all over again. Um, I'm also trying to create apocryphal um, around the Bible. So uh, there's all these apocryphal books um, that depending on sort of political moments of the time are included or not included in um, the canon of what the Bible is constructed for. Um, so this is my version of an apocryphal text. Genesis Apocrypha, Eve. Eve sat like a dropped fruit learning to breathe. A slow council of fox sisters came to order. Eve felt each minute arrive with its own burial instructions. Her clothing hardened and frayed. She went to find water and medicine. The milkweed pods broke open in a cotton goodbye. She started making little dolls of lashed reeds to leave behind. She cut beads off a tree and stuck them in the doll place for eyes. For Eve to make earth her child required a certain suspension of disbelief. 
to love her new life, to desire it. She first had to hate it, to find it undesirable. The foxes came out of hiding full of hen's eggs, the rose hips, red fists unfurled. Eve was either not ashamed or was a fuller degree of shame, meaning absolutely unastonished. What Eve loves about the earth fits in a room no bigger than a needle's eye. Imagine dreaming up the divine and then being made to leave. How would you name that? If what is holy is that which destroys you, there comes a time when you start to crave it. In the garden, Eve was a subvert, a flower with her lax sex, holding a snake by its rattle, asking, can't you talk to me? The opposite of ascension. How would you say it? She stumbled on the path to the water, and for the first time, pain stitched her to the night. She planted carrot, and locusts advanced across the sky. On earth, Eve learned a fox in heat will eat carrion just to stay full. Um, I went on a vacation recently and um, I only brought one book with me, which was the book um, Time as a Mother by Ocean Wong. And I would say it's a testament to my faith in, um, in Ocean Wong's writing that it was the only book that I brought thinking, I'm gonna love this. Turns out I didn't. Um, and I wanted to find a really nice way to say that um, because um, I respect Ocean Wong very much. Um, but uh, I think the worst thing a poem can be is indifferent. So if you love it or if you hate it, I think there's a thin line between the two. So um, I do love it. I just love it in a hate way, maybe. <laughs> um, so this is called Bull, and it's after Ocean Wong. After the bull departed, the smell of shit on the wind, the wind in the branches. I had no choice, the boy said, spinning a story like a shark in a dive, hitting the bullseye on the first try. When the bull departs, the boy watching it go has nothing but choices to make. The eyes are blue, the night is purple, and the bull's stillness, which is no more a god than God, now seems a bulletin the confessor had written before his charge confessed. However you define America, there is always some element of the bull in the china shop, the shelves of precious vessels that were never meant for such bullish hooves. The boy watches the bull make a bullpen of the Wedgwood. The boy sweeps up the bullets so often he makes an honest living of his broom. In America, we know beauty is nothing but a bully with a head for business. Why bother waking her at this hour? We have no use for another promise. The rope around the bull ring pulls the animal forward by the nose. The pain is urgent. It tells him where to turn. And um, this will be my last poem. The, uh, I'm very Irish, if you can't tell. Um, and uh, my sister also recently got married. Those two things are related because um, she got married in Ireland 
and she asked me to write a, a wedding poem, an epithalamian for her, um, for her wedding. So I wrote two and uh, I said, you can choose which one you'd like to go with. And uh, she, chose, uh, she chose one and this is the other one. And uh, it was it was in Massachusetts Review. And um, once once this is over, our time together is over. So I'll also just take this moment to say um, thank you for coming. I hope I didn't bum you out too much. Um, and um, thank you to um, Tej Silverman, who is one of um, my greatest friends and um, mentors and basically the person who um, sort of forced me into uh, writing and um, caring about writing and continuing to write. And, um, and also thank you to Mary Jo Bang, who I think is also here, who um, is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, and a person that is always in my head as I write uh, because her incisive knowledge and um, really thoughtful approach to writing has uh, stayed very close to me um, all these years. Um, so thank you for coming. Thank you to those people in particular. Um, thank you to everyone else who's here. Um, this is called Burren. Um, the Burren is a location in the west of Ireland. It's um, this very diverse ecosystem um, and it's found nowhere else on earth. If ages ago, the deep Arctic freeze which held the land could retreat in a slow engraving concert and with its exit leave the slate scored through by a signature of marks and pox. And if from the furrows, minor rivers could form like nerves across the gypsum and the stone packed land surrender to bloom and thicket, to hay and orchid. If because the light woodlands which rose from those crags and heaths sit beside the bog and marsh in an order so daring and unusual, it is to be found nowhere else on earth, if earth itself is made more rare for what is found there, for how delicately the pearl-bordered fritillary butterfly lays its nest on the leaf litter, for how desperately the sweet pine marten plucks the black thorn to feed her children. If the grace which everywhere defines this land is in any way equal to the original ache under which the glacial soil writhed, and if to arrive at this moment here on this land, we each had to find our own methods for flowering, for shouldering off the stone, then the case has already been made for love and all it touches and who with its touch it has made sacred. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful reading. I loved hearing poems I've heard and poems I don't know. Your work is so lush and so dark and deep and wonderful and varied. Um, it's just, it's really wonderful. Um, I want to thank everyone who helped put this together, Eddie and, and Emily. I want to thank Pam Glavin again for the gorgeous broadside. Please visit the website where you can order a broadside, where they will post a link to the reading once it's ready, probably take a few days for that, where you could subscribe to Mass Review, highly recommended. Um, thank you to everyone. And I, I wanna end with a quote that was on the 
the chat, maybe some of you saw it from a, a great friend of the magazine, Kevin Kwashi, who alas is not in the Valley anymore, but I'm so glad to see his name in the, in the chat. And um, I think I'll end with what he said, one of the things he said in his, his chat, all of this is a small, beautiful pause in the steady harsh of the world's terrible. And we need this kind of pause and this kind of beauty to get through. So thank you, Kevin, for that. And thank you, most of all, Robert, we wish you well. Good night, everyone.